But Vin speaks to us. He says, okay, this is a huge opportunity for you guys. This is going to be big. We want you to go and attack John Cena at the end of the show and smash everything up. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to wear these armbands with a little N on there. Didn't give us a, a reason why we were wearing the N. Didn't give us any nexus or anything like that. I said, put these on. Wade, you go down. Everyone else join him. Smash up everything. I want you to rip the ring apart. I want you to trash the table. I want you to punch the security guards, punch the referee, punch Jerry Lawler, beat up Justin Roberts, but don't joke him with the tie. I remember when I was, when I was, at that time in 2010, I hadn't watched that Raw. You know, sometimes when you watch Raw live, and it, well, all the time, if you watch it live, you have to watch it till four in the morning and your soul dies a little bit because you need to be up so late for it. Um, and but I hadn't watched this episode, and my friend texted me the next day and said, you need to watch this episode, but don't read any spoilers online. You need to see the end. And I had no idea what's going to happen. And then at the end of the show, John Cena's in the ring, and all of the NXT guys, including you, surround the ring. You beat the shit out of John Cena. Something happens to Justin Roberts, which we won't talk about because we're not supposed to. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and it's, it's chaos, and it's really shocking, and that's how the Nexus is born. How did that get pitched to you and I mean there can't really be a much better debut for a guy than the week after he wins a game show to be beating, beating up John Cena and propelling himself into the main event scene. Yeah so like I say we had these eight rookies on NXT season one and all we were ever told was the winner gets a WWE contract the remaining seven who knows so we were expecting they either get fired sent back home to South Africa or wherever they were from or they get, at best, sent back down to the developmental system and, and okay, come up with a new character, try and, try and make it back up on the road again. So when I won NXT, I was very excited because I knew I'd got the contract. Whatever happens, I get at least one week on Raw, SmackDown, and I debut as a WWE superstar. So I know, okay, I've got this, this is my opportunity. Now I've just got to go and take it. So the other guys were obviously pretty worried. I was worried for them. I was friends with a lot of these guys, and uh, I was concerned for them too. So... Um, a few days after I won NXT season one, I went home. I was obviously happy, celebrating, speaking to family and stuff. I got my travel through to fly to next week's TV tapings at Raw, which was going to be in Miami. Um, and then heard from the other guys that they'd all received travel information from WWE too. So all eight of us were going to be coming back to, to Raw. We didn't really know why. No one told us why. No one told us what I would be doing or the other guys. So anyway, we turn up. And still, they're not letting us in the locker room. And I'm like, well, surely I'm a WWE superstar now. I just wouldn't. I, I can get let in there, right? And they're like, no, no, you have to stay in the corridor still. I was like, man, how, when's this going to end? Like, I've been wrestling six years at this point. So, okay, I'm still a rookie, I suppose. So, um, anyway, just before the show starts, um, a runner comes up to me and gives me a little script of a promo they want me to do. Say, Vince has just approved this. They want you to go on camera with the, the backstage interview, a girl called Angela Fong. And she's going to interview you about your goals and aspirations and what you're going to do now you're a WWE superstar. So it was a very generic promo. It was like, okay, I've made it here now, and I'm Wade Barrett, and I'm going to be getting my way to the top of WWE. The kind of promo that every new guy will cut. So, okay, I did it, no problem. I walked away. Uh, I went back to my pile of bags in the corridor and thinking that was my work done for the night, and uh, waiting for me was John Laurinaitis. And he took me and the other rookies... Um, he said, follow me, you're going to come with me, I, Vince wants to speak to you. And I knew immediately, this is strange, because Vince sits in the gorilla position all show and he controls everything. He's on the headsets, he's looking at the times, looking at how the match is going, he's speaking directly to the referee, giving people cues, giving people information when they come back. He's very hands-on. So the fact that he wasn't sat in gorilla control in the show was very, very unusual. He's in his office, so we get taken to his office. When we get to his office, not only is Vince there, Triple H is there, two of the head writers are there, all of the agents are in there. And when I say agents, I mean people like Arn Anderson and Dean Malenko, Jamie Noble, the kind of guys who, who kind of give instructions to the guys wrestling the matches. And um, they're kind of top level management in WWE. So it's very bizarre. And I look around, okay, this doesn't make sense. So I think we're in a ton of trouble at this point. We've screwed something up. We're going to get yelled at again. We were kind of used to getting yelled at at that point. Um, but Vince speaks to us. He says, okay, this is a huge opportunity for you guys. This is going to be big. We want you to go and attack John Cena at the end of the show and smash everything up. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to wear these armbands with a little N on there. Didn't give us a, a reason why we were wearing the N. Didn't give us any nexus or anything like that. I said, put these on. 
Wade, you go down, everyone else join him, smash up everything. I want you to rip the ring apart, I want you to trash the table, I want you to punch the security guards, punch the referee, punch Jerry Lawler, beat up Justin Roberts, but don't choke him with the tie. <laughs> he didn't really say that part, but he should have. Um, but yeah, I mean, smash everything up. He said, look, we're going to replace everything next week, so do as much damage as you can. There are two rules. One, do not punch any member of the audience. I don't feel like he needed to tell us that, but he did. Number two, don't touch the cameras. Now, the cameras in WWE, the high-definition uh, high cameras, so they're all worth over $100,000, and we can't touch them because Vince isn't wasting that kind of money. So anyway, we go down to the ring, and just before, I, just before I leave, Fit Finley pulls me to one side, and he's a top agent in WWE. He says, okay, whatever happens down there, the one thing I want you to guarantee that you're going to do is to pull back the blue ring canvas, rip it off, cut, here's a, here's a Stanley knife or whatever, cut it open, pull it back, and expose the wooden boards that are underneath it. Because I think a lot of people think a wrestling ring is like a bouncy castle or a, a bed or something like that. It's not. It's basically canvas over boards of wood. And you get a, sometimes get a little bit of padding underneath there too, but, I mean, it hurts when you land on there. But to me, it was a bizarre thing for Fit Finley to tell me to do. I was like, why, why is he telling me to do that? What a, what a weird request of all this destruction we're going to go out there. Why does he want me to do that? So anyway, we go out, we, we attack, we smash everything up. The crowd's going nuts. They're all in shock. And I remember, oh, Fit told me to do that, so I'll make sure I do it. I don't want to upset him. So I could have opened with a standing knife, pulled it back, pulled the padding away, and there's these boards, and then we walk to the back. And I look at the crowd. There was a woman in the front row who was trying to climb over. She wanted to fight me. I re realized she was a little older, and she wasn't actually capable of scaling the barricade, so I was safe. And we all made our way to the back, and we're walking back, and... Um, we know we've done a good job, but our adrenaline's going and, and raw ends. We're not thinking too much of it. We walk back, and the entire locker room is stood there clapping us like we've just performed a miracle. I'm like, okay, this is strange. These people normally don't even want to shake our hands. What's going on here? And then I realized how big an impact this had. Vince is thrilled. Triple H is thrilled. The writers are thrilled. And then we saw a replay of what we'd done, and they showed the close-ups of the crowd's faces, and they genuinely looked terrified like it was something they'd never seen before. And then I saw what Fit Finley meant when he told me to, to pull the canvas back and expose the wooden boards. And something we get numb to as wrestlers, especially when we're coming through, is the sight of a ring that isn't fully put together. Because your job as an independent wrestler isn't just to go and wrestle. It's to put the ring up and take it down. And I'd put up thousands of rings at this point. And you carry the boards in, you put it up. At the end of the show, you're all beat up and tired, but you've got to take it back down. You carry the boards off, you load it back on the ring truck. And I'd done this nonstop throughout my career to this point. Fortunately, after that, I don't think I ever put up a ring again, but that was probably the last time I saw a, a ring in that state of disarray. But um, that's something that the crowd and the audience had literally never seen before. And that was the first time the majority of WWE's millions of people around the world watching it had ever seen a ring that wasn't perfectly set up and realized, no, it's not a bouncy castle. No, it's not a bed. There's wood under there. And... It really added to that sense of destruction and, and how we, we performed such a devastating act on Raw and, and really gave us some credibility. And after that moment, we were just off and running and, and we had all the credibility we needed from being these idiot rookies that were downing pints of Coca-Cola to a few weeks later being these, these terrifying killers that, that had some genuine heat, which is in this day and age almost impossible to get in wrestling. 100%. Um, and at that point, it was, it, there was a brand split at that point as well. So you guys weren't on SmackDown, it was just Raw. Uh, so you guys go backstage. I'm guessing the reaction's pretty good when you go back there. Um, how do you find out that they've decided to fire Daniel Bryan for choking out Justin Roberts? And did you think that that... Because it didn't really seem to have a huge effect on the group and also bringing him back at SummerSlam kind of made it come full circle. But at that point, when he's sort of taken out of the equation, were you guys worried? No, I mean, we were... I was, we were surprised when they fired Daniel Bryan because we found out about three days later. So we did the attack on, uh, on Raw, um, and I think, I think they fired him probably about three days after that. And we only found out through Twitter because when we came to the back after Raw, everyone shook our hands, nobody said a word to Daniel Bryan, nobody said a thing. Now, the funny thing was, Daniel Bryan didn't go through developmental. He'd had this career around the world where he was wrestling on the Indies, he was wrestling in Japan, and he had a different kind of training to the other seven guys who kind of started off on the Indies but made their way to um, 
developmental and, and receive further training. Now, we knew from being in developmental that two things were a no-no. One was choking, the other was spitting. Those are two things you do not do because Vince hates them. Um, obviously, those were the two things that Daniel Bryan decided to do. On the Nexus attack, he choked Justin Roberts with his tie and he spat on Cena at one point. So, that was something that even though he didn't go through developmental, that effectively cost him because he hadn't gone through developmental. It was a silly thing to fire him for, but I believe one of the main sponsors of WWE at the time made a complaint. They didn't like how horrific it was and how low down disgusting it was. This isn't the kind of product we want to be associated with. We need you to, to, we need WWE to act and respond to this. And the only way Vince could respond to that was to fire Daniel Bryan for it. So, you know, and we felt bad for him because we bonded with him at that point. But again, we, up until this point, we'd been treated as, as pieces of dirt who weren't allowed in the locker room. So we knew we were all technically, you know, on a, a thread away from being fired or being cut. So, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't as shocking as perhaps it was to a lot of the audience. <laughs>